everybody. I'm Dave Bogart, president of the Bloomfield Historical Society, and we are back with another oral history interview. And today we are very glad to have with us Al Eicher. Uh, Al is a founding board member of the Bloomfield Historical Society and has an extensive history in the Bloomfield area. Uh, he's lived here for 62 years with his wife, Catherine, and raised his children, Lori and David, here. Um, Al had a great career in radio, advertising, TV, and video production, and was very involved with Bloomfield Hill Schools and the local community, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, Al, you're a youthful 88 years old. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations on that. You look Thank great. You. Uh, you grew up in Pigeon, Michigan, so let's start there, and then we'll find out how you found your way to well, the Bloomfield area. Actually, I, I was born in Detroit, and my family went to California for three years, and on that fifth year, we moved to Pigeon. And Pigeon is a community of about 900 people. And uh, this is 1940, so you can picture uh, that is a long time ago. Anyway, in that town, uh, I was, uh, everybody knows everybody in a, in a small town like that, especially back then. Uh, even we, uh, doing a documentary there, we found they had water pipes made of wood, believe it or not. It was a farm community, and we, uh, I went to a one-room schoolhouse out in the country about a mile from town. That was quite an experience. My uh, grandfather owned a farm nearby, and it was right next to the high school. And up there, pheasant hunting was a very big uh, thing in September of each year, sometimes September into October. And as a high school student, uh, we would bring our guns to school during pheasant hunting. Naturally, not in the school, but we'd put them in the trunk of a car and uh, go pheasant hunting on my grandpa's property behind it. And not only, I mean, it was five and six guys at a time. Sometime our coach, football coach, would uh, hunt with us. Hunting was a really big thing up there at that time. Hard to imagine today, bringing guns to Yes, it is. School. One other story I should tell you about. Uh, 1940s and even into the 50s, you could buy dynamite in a hardware store. My grandpa asked me one day uh, if I wanted to go in to pick up a case of dynamite. I went in, uh, he had a horse, two horses, Dick and Doll, and we went into the local hardware, Mr. Diebel owned it, and we picked up a case of uh, dynamite, brought it out to the farm, and he did not have a tractor, he only had two horses, and he blew up stumps. And he told me, hide behind that tree. By the way, the stumps were from the great uh, 1881 fire, so farmland was cleared due to fires. So that's pretty much what uh, Pigeon was like. Everybody knew everybody. Right. So you graduated in 1953 from Pigeon High School, and what happened next? Well, from that, uh, when I graduated, uh, a representative from the National Institute of Technology came to our town, and I, uh, I was always interested in electronics, uh, and I took a class in high school on it. And uh, he convinced me that uh, television is and radio is the thing to do. So I came down here to Detroit to the National Institute of Technology. It was on Woodward near Forest Avenue, or Forest Street, and uh, Took a one-year uh, course there. It was uh, five hours a day, just intensive uh, training on electronics. And uh, <clears throat> Eisenhower, at the President Eisenhower at the time, was offering two days of college for every day of service. So I was thinking about that, and I get. Uh, uh, Quite by accident, I talked to a friend on a double date, and he told me his father died, and that uh, he was a candidate for draft board. The draft had already given him a notice. And I said to him, why don't I take your place? Because I would uh, like to get my college paid for. And so I went to the draft board, 
and they uh, agreed. And so that's how I got uh, into the Army after I had one, uh, one year at the Institute of Technology. And the, at this time, it is uh, at the very end of the Korean War. So that's how I got that far. Yeah. So you spent some time in uh, Missouri. I was uh, basic training. Basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and did my eight weeks there. It was worst time you could ever do it. Missouri has the reddest mud that sticks to your feet. You get about six inches taller when you're marching with the mud on your feet. Uh, I after the eight weeks, I was furloughed for one week. Came home, and they sent me to uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey to the, uh, actually that is U.S. Army Communication Headquarters. Uh, it's right on near uh, Asbury Park, New Jersey, and about a half mile from New York City. It is the greatest duty that you could ever have. And I had uh, eight months of electronics training at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Our instructors were GE and RCA engineers. Uh, Asbury Park uh, had a great boardwalk along the ocean, not only a nice beach as well, we could go swimming there. And by the way, if you were in, um, in the military at that time, transportation was free to and from the base to New York City. And uh, if you wanted to go to the casino at Asbury Park, it wasn't a gambling casino. It was a place where you could go and attend concerts with the four lads and the McGuire sisters, Pat Boone, uh, Bill Haley and the Comets. Wow. And for a military person, it was all free. Those are big names. Yes, they were. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. So you got a, a continued training in, I the, did. in the military. I uh, did. Uh, after uh, Fort Monmouth, I uh, was sent to Fort Gordon, Georgia. Uh, I spent uh, at, at Fort Gordon, I was there for two solid years. And that was a great duty. It was extremely hot down there. If you think Michigan summers are hot, it's twice as hot down there. I was assigned to the 228 Signal Company and it just so happened, uh, President Eisenhower, uh, the Southern White House was in Augusta, Georgia. And so he, President Eisenhower and Mamie uh, Eisenhower would uh, come down there during the summer and uh, spend their weekends there in Augusta. So our company in Fort Gordon sent a lot of troops to march uh, in front of uh, Mamie and um, the president when he would come in. Uh, he looked so healthy, unbelievable, both of them. They really looked uh, good. Uh, we built uh, down there a field radio station out in the Clark Hill Dam area. And we also uh, had a microwave link for communications between various areas. Uh, when my outfit uh, was given orders to ship out to Europe, I only had five months left, and I wasn't eligible to go with my the 228 signal company. So my first sergeant said to me, uh, Al, do you know how to swim? I said, "I'm yes, I'm from Michigan. I was a Boy Scout. I know how to swim. He said, well, we're going to send you to the U.S. Army Aquatic School and we need lifeguards and waterfront instructors for the pools at Fort Gordon. So I went seven days, and it just so happened, the school and the place where we were doing eight hours a day in the water, doing some struggle work in the water for drowning persons, it was right on the fairways of the Augusta National oh, okay. Golf Course. The aroma of the flowers there, morning and at night, was just unbelievable. You thought you were in a perfume factory. Anyway, uh, I had uh, uh, about uh, eight to ten weeks of uh, being a lifeguard and waterfront instructor at the officers' club and the girl and the WAC detachment pool. 
At the WAP detachment pool one day, I had an uh, unbelievable event occur. Uh, one of the WACs went off of a board and was down at the bottom of the pool, drowning. And someone saw her down there. I did not. And so I dove in, got down there, pulled her out, and got help getting her out of the pool up on the side. And I was able to revive her. And she turned out to be from Bay City, Michigan, <laughs> strangely what enough. What a coincidence. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my uh, first uh, life-saving person. So. so after the military, you go back to the National Institute of Technology. I did. Uh, I went back there. Uh, that would be uh, early 1957. And uh, because of the training that I had at Fort Myers, New Jersey, I asked if I could take some tests to advance in the course, because the whole name of the game was to get a first class license from the Federal Communications Commission, so I could have a work at a television station or a radio station. So I took some tests, and believe it or not, uh, I. Uh, had a semester, it was during the summer, we were off from school, and I met my wife, Catherine, up in Pigeon. She was a dance student from University of Michigan, and she was applying fluoride to uh, people's, uh, children's teeth up in Pigeon. We did not have fluoride in the water. And it turned out that I was also a waterfront instructor and lifeguard for the high school during the summer months. I was called by the principal because he knew of me in the Army. And uh, so I had Catherine's, the people she was supposed to be putting fluoride on their teeth, I had them as swimming students to teach them how to swim, young ones. And we met. And uh, uh, after meeting her, I thought, that's my gal. And so I went uh, back to the uh, electronic school and I was able to go to the uh, FCC building on 4th Street in Detroit. And I wrote for all three uh, tests and I got my license. And it was also at this time that Channel 5 television was uh, on the air testing Channel 5, ABC, that was NBC, Detroit, I'm sorry, Saginaw and Bay City. I called the engineer up there. I actually had called him before I got my license. And he said, if you get your license, we'll hire you. So I called him and said I have my license, interviewed, and I was hired. So I moved to Bay City. Uh, for that time, and in the meantime, uh, Catherine and I were engaged six months later, and a year later we were married. Uh, at that time, uh, the station went from being on the air 12 hours, 12 hours a day to 18 hours. So we would open in the morning with the NBC Today Show with Dave Garraway, and we would close at night with the Jack Parr show, The Tonight Show. The Tonight Show, the original Tonight Show. The correct. original Tonight Show. Yeah. And we did closed circuit uh, things uh, at the IMA Auditorium, and we did not have videotape. So all of our uh, recordings, uh, news, weather, sports, all live. And we, <clears throat> in 1960 at the station, we got our first big two-inch uh, Ampex recording machine. Those were good times, yes. but we ran a lot of film. Uh, the news reporting back then was totally different than what you'd have today as far as pictures. We actually cut pictures out of the Bay City Times, the, the newspapers, oh, yeah. to get the pictures <laughs> for us to have on the screen. Oh, that's great. The so, so that started your career in broadcasting. Now, at some point, you bought a radio station. Yes, at, at Channel 5 Television, uh, Ray Lane was hired a week before I was. And he was a sportscaster, he's a Michigan State grad. Uh, 
And for people yeah. of a certain age, Ray Lane is a very familiar name. He was a Detroit uh, area broadcast. Well, yeah, Ray and I stayed together, and we were, I think, in our third year at Channel 5 when another uh, TV director, Jerry, uh, got the three of us, the t three of us together, and he said, "Hey, there's a radio station for sale up in the Houghton Lake, West Branch, Roscommon area." Uh, would you be interested in going in on a partnership? So uh, I agreed, and we ended up buying this station, and Mr. Garrity, who owned the TV station, fired all of us within, uh, when the FCC gave us our permit to ownership. Uh, he heard about it, and we thought we were gonna operate as, uh, you know, weekend, weekend operators. And uh, so that put Ray and I and Jerry into the radio business up there. A recession came into play, although we did remotes, uh, basketball games, and I even had a, a Sunday morning show, a music show, and while I was sitting in the uh, an announce, uh, we had studio room like this, Four deer came up to the window of the studio and with that big long tongue licked the glass in front. <laughs> so I announced to everybody on the road, if you're passing by, take a look at the deer in, in front of the studio. It was a wonderful time, but actually uh, it uh, within a year we decided it isn't going to support three of us. Right. So, so that's what brought you to the Detroit area? So Ray, or, uh, Ray left first. And now I'm looking for a job because it's not going to work. And I had just had uh, my daughter was born, so she was only one and a half year old. So one day I get a call from Ray and he said, hey, I'm working for Channel 2 and I'm doing uh, uh, some work for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, with a company called Giant View Television. They have the contract for the camera work. And uh, he said, they're looking for a cameraman. So I came down to Detroit, and they, I went to Olympia Stadium and cameraed uh, uh, one of the games. And things worked out where they said, how would you like a full-time job? Because those were, you know, the Red Wings aren't year-round. So I got a full-time job from them, moved Catherine down to Madison Heights, and much to my surprise, uh, Chevrolet, uh, once a year, was involved in what's called the Mobile Economy Run. Actually, the Mobile, the mobile Economy Run would start in California and end at Copo Hall. And Giant View, our group, got the contract to uh, televise the closing of it, of the, uh, the end of the race, okay? And while I'm there, uh, two executives from Campbell Ewald are in our control room. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, I get to talking with them, and a big surprise, two weeks later, I'm up at Campbell Ewald's offices installing a 35 millimeter projection system for some of their uh, studios and screening rooms because they are doing the Dinah Shore show putting commercials into that, and you have to screen the programs, make sure there's nothing in there that's gonna offend Chevrolet. Well, make a long story short, uh, I, uh, Campbell Ewald uh, hired me to be manager uh, in their uh, creative department. So uh, uh, I left Giant View, and now I'm an employee of Campbell Ewald, and we did a lot of uh, projects, uh, when I say projects, uh, in presenting the, uh, putting the commercials into those uh, shows. Bonanza was a real big show at the time, and then we picked up uh, Bewitched, My Three Sons, Route wow, 66, yeah. and then uh, all of these shows had to be screened before they were put on the air. It was a very 
uh, interesting time, very busy time. Those are legendary shows. They were, yeah. they were. And then, uh, much to my surprise, uh, we were kind of tired of uh, renting a house in uh, Madison Heights, and we got, uh, we got the idea, let's, uh, because quite a few of the people that I worked with at Campbell Ewald, they lived in Birmingham and they lived in Bloomfield Hills. So Chamberlain Real Estate showed us three houses one day and we picked one of them. And one of them was in the Kentmore subdivision. And that it was on uh, 1415 Lennox Road. Kentmore subdivision is right near Adams Road and uh, Square Lake Road. And that was a two acre site. And believe it or not, uh, there was a bomb shelter in the backyard. It really wasn't a bomb shelter, but it was, we had a 114 foot well, and the well room to enclose the pump was seven by seven by seven feet tall. So it had a cover on it. And because of that property having a, a large Macintosh orchard, I think I had four Macintosh trees. One year I got almost 15 bushel of wow. apples and I stored them down in that, what I call my bomb shelter. And, and it really did work. I mean, as like far as cellar. March and April, I still had apples down there. They were a little soft, but not bad. From still edible. Picking. Oh, <laughs> excellent, excellent apples. So. Uh, yeah, let's see. I think I'll look and see what else I can come up with here. Yeah, where did your kids go to school? Oh, that's a good, good question. Uh, my daughter uh, was born in 61, and David was born in 64. So our children went to the uh, Eastover uh, School. Uh, that is on uh, Westview, right near the uh, fire station. Dave, I should mention that living out there in Bloomfield, in the Kentmore subdivision, uh, the way to get to work was fantastic. We had a train that stopped. Oh, yeah, right. The train stopped at uh, where the Hunt Club is today. Uh, at uh, it would be Kensington and Long Lake Road. So Catherine would take me there. For two dollars, I could go downtown to the Milwaukee station. Uh, which is if I walk from the station down Grand Boulevard over to Second Avenue, there's the GM building. So you get your exercise in the morning and for two bucks to go down, two dollars to come back at night. It was fantastic. Was that a pretty popular way for people oh. to get to work? I mean, oh. A lot of your neighbors and things on the train as well? The, the train, the cars that we were on had green velvet seats, not leather, green velvet. I, I would picture Abraham Lincoln might be sitting in the, that's how ancient the cars were, but they were so clean. They were, and you could really count on, on them. They made another stop, I, I think again to Ferndale and Royal Oak, but uh, it was a great way to travel and pretty reasonable. Uh, and did you have one car at the time? A lot of people just had one car. Well, I had Chevrolets, that's for sure. I had a Chevy 2 Super Sport. And uh, in 1968, at the introduction, because here we are in the creative department, we're doing 108 commercials a year for Chevrolet. And they didn't air those commercials more than two or three times. But when the Camaro came out in 1968, we had it come out of a volcano. It was a yellow Camaro, and it had a super stripe, uh, SS sport stripe on the front end of it. It came out. So I knew I had to have a Camaro. And on announcement day at McCarthy Chevrolet, I bought their first car off of the showroom floor, $2,600. It was a great car. Yeah. And I'm sure uh, dirt roads in, at the time? Oh, boy. Uh, at that time, Square Lake Road was dirt, as, and Squirrel Road was a dirt road. And you could take uh, Adams out quite a ways, but that too went into a dirt road when you get way out there. Uh, 
I, uh, let's see, it would be around, uh, here we are, we're living in that house. And by 1966, I hired uh, Starlight Pool Company in Southfield to build a kidney-shaped pool in the backyard. I mentioned it because uh, I-75 at the time, in 66, was now in full construction. When we moved there, there was nothing, no highway uh, clearance or anything. So here we are, they're excavating the farm that is on the other side of Square Lake Road, which we know today as the Bower School Farm. But at the east end of it, nearest Adams Road, that was being excavated for gravel and stone. Mm -hmm. And since I had built a, have this pool built, I needed decorative rock. And I mean boulders like this. And they were uncovering them in the excavation and they piled up these big rocks all over the place. So on weekends, uh, the kids, in fact, I have a picture of the kids sliding down the sand and gravel areas of the pits. And I mean, these are 30 to 40 feet deep where you could slide down in the sand and gravel. Uh, but we picked up a lot of rocks and brought them home for the, to put around our swimming pool. Yeah, how'd you get them home? Uh, it was a job uh, yeah. with uh, ramps to get them up into the trunk of the car. Oh, sometimes my car would go home like a rocket getting ready to shoot off because the front end of the car was way up and the back end was down. Right. But I was able to uh, work that out. Yeah. Now, you had uh, an experience uh, oh, involving bees, a number of different cases, but you yeah. became a beekeeper. I, I, I want to touch on that a little bit. Well, I became a beekeeper, and uh, Cranbrook uh, had me come over there and teach some beekeeping classes for a while. But uh, no, uh, in uh, 1967, uh, a large swarm of bees landed in a bush by the swimming pool. That's why I brought the swimming pool into this picture. Uh, we had a two-acre lot, and I called the township. When, when those bees landed there, I thought, with our apple trees, they would be the best pollinators. I wonder if we could keep the bees with the township permitted. Because I had the two-acre lot, they permitted it. Actually, on one acre lot could do it in, in our area. So I t called the clerk. They said it was okay. I called a beekeeper in the Utica area. Man was almost 80 years old. He came and helped capture it, and he brought a old empty hive with some frames. And within 20 minutes, he had captured all the bees on the bush and got them in. And so I decided. You know, this is, uh, we're going to see what, how big the apples are going to be next year. Because this was like in May. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, my hive swarmed, and I had now a second uh, hive to, I captured the second set of bees. Uh, it was a very strong hive that I had. So now I have two hives in the backyard, and I decided... I'm going to call the Bloomfield Fire Department and the police department and ask them if they get any calls where there's bees in somebody's backyard, I'll come and pick them up. Because bees at the time, to buy bees from a Medina a Bee Company would be like $30 for three pounds of bees. Today it's $120 hmm. to buy bees. Very expensive. Not only that, the hives are expensive, too. So anyway, uh, we got uh, the bees in there. And one night on the second year, I got a call from the Open Hunt Club. And it was Elizabeth uh, Smith, who was administrator or manager over there. And she said, I heard you keep bees. And we're in our national uh, horse show. And they do the corsage there with the rails and the jump site. Mm -hmm. And she said, we've got an audience. The people are in the stands, and we have to stop the show because there's bees on one of the rails 
uh, on the course. Could you come over and take them off? I uh, had an empty frame at home, got some honey, put it on some wax uh, framework, went over there. I had a Cadillac then, believe it or not. And uh, with David in the back of the car, uh, in the, had the uh, hive in the trunk, drove on to the course, and about uh, 20 minutes, I found the queen bee in there and captured them. And we drove away and got a big round of applause from the audience. So now you're the local bee expert. So too, now yeah. I'm the local bee expert, yeah. <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, I want to talk about the, the ox roast that you have because that's one of the most yeah. fascinating things. And if you get on the Bloomfield Historical Society website, we do have that's a video right. that you put together that's for the right. 1976 ox roast. So why don't you well, touch on the history of that? And well, the, <laughs> Dave, the ox roast first started. Actually, my first roast was involved our church, uh, men and boys outing, and a, a man showed me uh, how to roast uh, an ox. And these are 75 to 80 pound uh, Angus is what I started out with. Angus have short legs compared to uh, Charlay has long legs. Anyway, and this is a fundraiser for the. This was a fund. Well, it was a fund for the church. It was just to feed people. Okay. Uh, for an outing, but at uh, uh, when bringing it to uh, Bloomfield, Catherine was very active in the parent-teacher organization, and uh, she was always over at the school. And she said, uh, you know, uh, to raise money for various projects, we're making twenty-five dollars here and thirty dollars there. And I said to her, well, why don't we do something big? Next year, let's do something big. So that's when I said, why don't we do an ox roast over there? There's 350 to 400, 500 people in the school, elementary school. Uh, let's do an ox roast, and you can sell cookies and everything else on the side, but let's do an ox roast. I could buy meat then for a dollar a pound. So a hind quarter of Angus is uh, 75 to 80 pounds. And if you want to put the rump roast on it, that adds 10 more pounds to, the, to it. So at that time in September, I think it was uh, 68. In September 68, I had a couple of my friends who were fascinated to say, hey, we're going to roast a 80-pound piece of meat. Uh, we used 100 pounds of charcoal. Uh, so whenever you do, if you want to try doing a hind quarter, 100 pounds of charcoal to 80 pounds of meat. We did three, and I thought, I've done a lamb before. I'll put a whole lamb on. We kind of shocked a person. A lady came by while we were roasting, and she said, my do I lost my dog. And one of my guys working there pointed to the lamb at the end, because the head is on and the legs oh, no. and the whole thing. This is a whole lamb. Right. And this woman just went bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> that we would. Poor lady. She yeah. knew it wasn't our dog, but okay. it, to even talk <laughs> about it. Uh, anyway, we uh, had like about 350 people show up for this, baked beans, corn on the cob. And uh, so for the next two years at, the, uh, at East Over School, we did these ox roasts. And, we raised enough money to do um, new curtains for the stage in the gymnasium and carpet the uh, principal's uh, office. And we had other things too, but uh, that was where uh, we, uh, like I say, we raised uh, $2,800. In fact, I'm looking at my notes now. Yeah, that's quite a bit of money at the yeah. time. So at that time, I left Campbell Ewald and uh, joined a company called Magnetic Video Corporation out in uh, Farmington. And the following year, uh, June Hamilton at uh, Bloomfield School Administrator, she called me and at that time, the school acquired the farm. And that was in 71. And she said, I know you've done roasts, uh, what do you think we could do at the farm? We need to raise money for fencing and a variety of things. They needed a pole barn. Uh, so I said, uh, if I can get my crew to come and help, 
I'm sure there'll be others who'll want to help. So the first one, I had uh, four fellows, and uh, we uh, had 10 hindquarters. So I had uh, 1,000 pounds of charcoal wow. brought in. This is hardwood uh, charcoal. This is not what you'd call blacktop tarvy from a street that's got blacktop. That'll burn too, but real char uh, charcoal. And it takes seven and a half hours to cook a hindquarter. So the first year we did uh, 10, the farm had a root cellar. So when I had the meat brought in from Pigeon, Michigan, I had friends up there, uh, Amish friends. Uh, they did not own the slaughterhouse, but I got the meat from them. They were all corn-fed uh, Angus, and eventually I had to get Charlay too because we got much bigger with this. Anyway, uh, when the meat would arrive, the root cellar at the farm was which is a, still there, correct? Which You're is still there. Right. We would bring the meat in to the root, uh, root cellar, and uh, we kept it up on tables. We didn't want it on the ground in case there were mice or rats around. I never saw a rat on the farm. But anyway, that's where we dressed the meat and put the stainless steel skewers in to mount it over a, a fire pit. Uh, so we started out with 10, and the next year we raised a lot of money. 1972, we did uh, 14, and uh, I, we, again, it takes seven and a half hours to roast, so we had to time it. So for 14, uh, we had a lot of carvers up on the hill where the log cabin is now is uh, the area where we actually had a trenches put in, dug a trench maybe uh, eight, in, eight uh, inches deep, banked the walls, and the pictures that you'll see will show that. Uh, so that's right along Square Lake Road. That's on Square Lake Road. That's where we roasted the hindquarters. Uh, again, it was seven and a half hours. In 73, I took my bees to the farm because now I had more bees at the house and because of the kids swimming in the pool, their footprints, the watery footprint, my bees would fly in and get a drink of water oh. off their footprint. So I didn't want the kids to get stung because we had a lot of children come to our uh, pool area. So uh, I moved the bees over to the school farm uh, and uh, let's see, I moved them over uh, in 73, and we did a ox rose, like I say, for every year over there. And the big one was the bicentennial, 1976. Well, uh, just before that, I, uh, I, I had Ed Cole and Dolly Cole out at the farm as guests and carvers, because at these roasts, I'd have... Uh, uh, various celebrities come out. I had Alice Karras from the Detroit Lions come out to carve meat. Dr. Thorns was superintendent of schools here in Bloomfield. Oh, they were Ed Cole is too. And Ed uh, came out. And Dolly, his wife. Who is Ed Cole? Uh, Ed Cole was president of General Motors right, at okay, the time. Yeah. And uh, Dolly, his wife, were out and they thought, oh, the farm is really, really great. Uh, and Dolly said to me, you should have some buffalo out here. I have a friend in Metamora who raises buffalo. I said, really? So I talked with the farm manager, and uh, June uh, 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 Hamilton, and they said, do you think you could get them? I said, yeah, well, I'll go out. So a friend of mine and I went out with a horse trailer to get two calves, buffalo calves. Well, when we got out to the farm at Metamora, uh, these were big calves. And I mean big calves to where, uh, and they didn't have rings in the nose to be able to guide them around. We, for an hour and a half, tried to corral them to get them into the trailer. They were wiry, just they could turn around. and uh, One of them ran through a crack in the wall of the barn and ruined the barn wall. And that's when the 
owner of them said, I'll bring them to you at the farm. So a few days later, uh, they came to the farm. But it was a bad idea. And the reason is the buffalo would push the cattle away from the feeders when they got bigger so and bigger. they're pretty aggressive. Thing. And then they're out in the field, and if they thought the grass on the other side of the fence was better, they'd stick their head under the fence and lift the fence post right out of the ground. Wow. And so a couple of times I got called, the buffalo are out on Square Lake Road. Uh, can you come over and help us corral them? They're not easy to direct uh, at all. We had a heck of a time getting them back into the farm. Eventually, I had to call, uh, I didn't call, the farm did, called the Detroit Zoo, and the Detroit Zoo took the two buffalo off the farm. That's how that happened. So do you want to talk about 1976, the, the oh. big ox roast? Oh, this, this was something else. It involved parades of <laughs> classic yeah. cars and things? It sure did. Uh, June call, uh, Hamilton called and uh, wanted to know uh, about could we get the crew together for another roast. Well, a great deal of planning went into this one, and Dr. Bauer uh, was very active with his school. And he had. So a, he was a local physician. That was he was a on local the, physician, the, uh, school correct. board, and the school board, and the, the Bauer School Farm is named after. And he owned a collection of antique cars. And so it was organized to have a parade down Square Lake Road in front of, from Squirrel all the way up, uh, quite a ways, past uh, the entrance to the farm today. And uh, the marching bands from uh, uh, Lasser and Andover, uh, we had quite a parade going by. In fact, it's on the a video that we uh, have. And uh, at that time, uh, they thought we could maybe get 2,000 people to show. So how many hindquarters do you need to feed 2,000 people? Well, at least 20. So, and I, at that time, I was paying a dollar and nine cents a pound. And I, to make sure that we'd have enough meat, I asked the slaughterhouse uh, and by the way, we age the meat for two weeks after they're killed, uh, just to uh, have the meat, it, it just cooks better when it's aged. So we had 10 pounds of rump attached to the hindquarter. So we were around 85 to 90 pounds. We got 25 hindquarters. And <clears throat> I had uh, the farm, actually dig a trench with a tractor, it was over 100 feet long, and that was in the actual site where the log cabin is today, running parallel to the woods. And uh, we roasted uh, 25 hindquarters, and that was both Charlet and Angus, and I had, just for the cooking crew, because I had about 10 people, we put a lamb at the very end of that, and we've got photos of that too. Uh, two tons of charcoal were brought in. We used it all up. And at, after we were into doing 10 and 14 hind quarters at a time and roasting at this one, we auctioned off the bones. We actually auctioned off earlier. This is how we got the idea. People would pay $10 for the bone to take it home for their dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I mean, the bone is this long, right. this big around, and they would uh, uh, take it home. We got, on the last one, $250 for uh, the 25 bones. Uh, and we auctioned them off just like an in, uh, auctioneer. Those were good times. And how many people ended up coming to that one? 2,500. And how much money was raised? Oh, I know we raised money for uh, more cyclone fence to go around the farm. Uh, there were thousands of dollars uh, raised for that. I, we were pretty lenient. I think uh, three and a half uh, dollars maybe for uh, uh, children and five dollars for uh, uh, adult. Pretty, pretty good price. You couldn't feed them today like that. Yeah. I mean, we had to have all the accompanying dishes too. 
Uh-huh. Well, there were a lot of paper plates and uh, the, you know, the cafeteria service of the school actually came out and uh, handled all of the sides. I mean, there was uh, corn and baked beans and things of that nature. Yeah. That's a great story. Uh, and all the while, you're, you're continuing your career in communications. Uh, yes. 20th Century Fox. Well, uh, Norman dealing with Norman Lear. Well, that was after after Magnetic Video. Uh, at Magnetic Video, uh, we came up with the idea of home video because the Betamax and the VHS machines were now available. This is like 1975. And when I left Campbell Ewald uh, to go to Mag Video, they were a video duplicating company or audio duplicating company, and they wanted to get into video because of the Betamax introduction. Uh, within a couple of years, by when I say 1975, the Betamax was established. RCA and Panasonic were making a VHS machine. Andre Blay, the owner of Mag Video, came to a board meeting one day and he said, you know, I think people would buy movies if we could provide them cheap enough. And uh, so he contacted 20th Century Fox and bought 50 movies uh, from Fox as a test. We bore, uh, borrowed uh, $400,000 from the Detroit Bank and ran a full page ad in TV Guide magazine on Thanksgiving weekend, 1977, and asked people, if you'd like to be a member of the Video Club of America, send us $10 and you can have, buy any one of these 50 movies uh, for $39.95 a copy. 14,000 people in that double truck ad that we had in TV Guide magazine, November 1977, sent us a check. Wow, what were some of the titles of the movies you were? We had, uh, at that time, Hello Dolly, Patton was in there. Uh, Dr. Doolittle, French Connection. Uh, these are really, we had really good movies. Well, in the meantime, Paramount and Universal were suing Sony for making a machine that was, could record their movies off of television. They lost the lawsuit, and one day I got a call from Paramount. Once we were a sta- we were established with 50 movies of 20th Century Fox. They called and said, would you copy 10 movies for us to test the idea? Universal also called. So we were now duplicating movies for Universal and 20th Century Fox and Paramount. Within six months after that, uh, 20th Century Fox bought our company. So now we're owned by Fox. And our staff, we probably grew by 30 to 40 people at Mag Video. We built big studios out there for not only uh, doing productions for corporations, Goodyear, Ford shot in our studios. And uh, it was uh, really a great time. My problem was I was traveling a lot, and now I couldn't keep uh, take care, good care of the bees on the farm. The last uh, caring of the bees on the farm uh, <clears throat> was in the September, uh, probably around in the 80s, early, uh, uh, early 80, 81 or so. And uh, there was a uh, electrical storm taking place. I asked a friend of mine to come over and help me take honey off the hive. And uh, in, he came over with what uh, the type of loose suit that you'd wear if you were sailing a boat uh, that is open on the waist, but he had uh, the bottoms of long pants. I told him, make sure the bees don't get up your, in your ankles, so he had big socks on. But the top was, you know, the, uh, the outfit you'd wear. I gave him a... a covering for his face so he wouldn't get stung. And we're, I'm opening up first hive, and we notice 
there's, uh, it's going to rain. We don't know when, but it's going to rain. And uh, I open up the first hive, and he's taking a paintbrush and brushing the honey off, or the bees off the honey, and putting the frames down. We're about 40 feet away from uh, the gate, and we have uh, steel fencing all around the farm now, a cyclone fence, and the gate is metal. And uh, we open the second one up, and as I open it up, a whole bundle of bees hit the ground and explode and go up under his shirt and around his stomach, and he is being stung everywhere. And I, I don't know if he's allergic to sting or not because he hasn't worked with me much. So I told him, run to the car, and he did. And now it's starting to rain, and the bees are coming back into the hive, so you're getting 100% population. And I uh, <clears throat> get the bees into the hive, close up the cover, and I'm starting to run back to the car, and I grab the rail fence or the steel fence gate to close it. Lightning hits down in the field on the fence. So it knocks me down and I am really stunned. And all I can taste is a strange taste. I don't know what copper tastes like, but that's what it felt right. to me. For three days, I had that copper taste in wow. me. And uh, that was kind of the last time that I took care of my bees. I turned them over to the farm. And uh, the they, end of that chapter. Of that the, was the end life. of that. Yeah. As we're uh, starting to wrap it up here, yeah. we, we want to talk about a couple of things. Everybody's okay. probably wondering what Davy and Goliath are doing here. So we want to talk about okay. that. And then we want to talk about your involvement with the Bloomfield Historical Society, okay. too. So let's talk well, about Davy and Goliath. OK. To acquire Davy and Goliath, I had to, I'm no longer working for 20th Century Fox. And I had five more years with uh, Embassy Home Entertainment, Norman Lear. Norman Lear, I was uh, uh, Senior Vice President of Acquisitions and Production. And uh, so I was buying movies for the company to put out as home video. And I traveled to Cannes Film Festivals and places. And I bought movies, European movies, as well as the American movies, and spent a lot of time in New York uh, buying property from producers there. Uh, Embassy wasn't interested in Davy and Goliath, and at that moment, Coca-Cola said, we're interested in buying Embassy, and they wanted me to move to California, and I didn't want to. So I approached uh, the owners of Davy and Goliath, which is a Lutheran church in America, and I bought Davy and Goliath. That's how I got it. And I bought 69 episodes, and for 13 years, um, my son David and I handled the marketing and distribution of Davy and Goliath. We had it in Spanish, even in Korea. The Korean military actually had uh, got the first Davy and Goliath. Uh, I don't know all the story behind that, but that is how we got Davy, and we sold over a million copies of Davy and Goliath up through uh, 2003, and it's still available now if uh, you want a Davy and Goliath. It's, it's sort of a timeless show, I think. That's right. I think I, the lessons that so I ended up uh, with a television production company, which we called Program Source International. Ten years after I had it, uh, David became president of it, and uh, now we're in the lecture business, and also uh, David builds websites. And the lecture business has been good for us. Production business is slower, but uh, lots of lectures, sometimes up to 85 lectures a year. Now we're down around 45. Yeah. So now it's uh, around 2003 or so, and there's talk about forming a Bloomfield Historical Society. Oh, absolutely. For the area. OK, how did that happen? <clears throat> because of having the production company and David and I had done 20 documentaries on the history of towns in Michigan. Karen Cotulis Carter, who was head of uh, uh, the uh, Bloomfield Library, the Township Library, uh, it was coming up on the 30th year 
uh, a celebration was being talked about, their anniversary of the library. And uh, in talking to her, she knew we would, had done these documentaries and she had heard about the orphan train in Michigan and some of the other documentaries we did. She contacted us to see, are you interested uh, in doing a documentary of the uh, library for us? And we said we were. And we did, and it, in that conversation, she said, I'm trying to start a historical society here in the township. And I met Steve Raphael and Pam Carmichael and uh, Katie and Dwight. And by 2004, we had officially uh, our papers from the state of Michigan as an incorporated uh, operation and organization. And you know, the society has grown leaps and bounds. We've got a fantastic website, as you know. You've been running the place beautifully for quite a few years now after <laughs> Pam yeah. handled it. Uh, we uh, were involved with the moving of the log cabin from, I think, over on Lone Pine. Right. Yeah. And then uh, once that was moved, uh, we, we spent a lot of time over there before that move. Uh, there was talk about dismantling it log by log and rebuilding it back over at the farm. I'm glad we didn't do that. Uh, but then uh, the uh, Barton House came uh, came up as uh, something that could be at the farm. Right. So David and I televised uh, the, uh, the moving, which is a... Uh, an interesting event to watch the utility companies raise the wires to get the buildings underneath. And um, then people uh, walking along next to the houses. It's, oh, it's yes. And then down the street to have a foundation in place to bring the Barton house over and the people that moved it to just drop that thing, pull out the logs and fit perfect. It really was amazing. Oh, it was. It and was you a, captured it. Oh, it's all it's all yeah. captured on video. Well, I think we got the best website in the state of Michigan yeah, as far as website. as a historical society, no doubt. Bloomfieldhistoricalsociety.org. If you want That's to check right. it out, there's the film of the ox roast. That's right. That on is there. in there. And the house yeah. being moved. Yeah. So it's it's been great uh, sixty some years living here in Bloomfield. I never thought I'd live in the city growing up in a small town like Pigeon, but yeah. it's been great. Well, you've got some great stories, and we're well, glad we got to yeah. hear them. Well, thank so you. thank you very much thank for, you for inviting coming me. today. I think we've covered about everything. We could probably go on and on and on, well, but <laughs> at some point we have to Well, there were so. a lot of good experiences over here, and the school farm, uh, to me, is a real blessing. I mean, we, we, uh, we need to support that uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's really an amazing yeah. place. Yeah, and the log cabin, boy. If you want to know how the early pioneers lived, that's the place to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Al. We appreciate it. And um, look right. forward to our next um, oral history interview sometime soon. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate it.